Good morning, everyone. Uh, good, morning. good morning to those of you in the room here and uh, to those of you online. I want to welcome you to our first face-to-face -face ISI fellow seminar in many years. <laughs> and um, our, our plan for today was to have all of our presenters be here in person, but as you all know, the weather didn't cooperate and the uh, FAA didn't cooperate. And um, so our two first presenters are gonna be doing their thing online. Um, and we'll get to that in just a second. Um, while people are still joining, I'll just make a few introductory remarks. Um, for those of you online, I'm sorry, we have refreshments in the room, but oh. we haven't figured out yet how to do that by Zoom. <laughs> Next time, maybe. Although I'll say that the, the technology's changed so quickly. Um, I mean, I have Lisa here with me helping out and she's very good at this, but even she is learning new things about it this morning. Uh, and so thanks to um, uh, Teresa and Marie for uh, helping out, uh, helping us figure out how to do things. Uh, just a quick reminder about ISI. One of our primary uh, duties and, and activities is to support alumni uh, who want to continue doing their research um, or their professional practice in various ways. And we give them the fielding name to help do that. <clears throat> and for people who want to publish, and more and more of our fellows are doing that, uh, and they're collecting data to help them publish, uh, we have the IRB review process, of course, that uh, we extend to you. Um, the other thing that we encourage you to think about doing is to, um, for those of you who are interested in doing this, offering some sort of continuing education, professional development. Uh, and again, Fielding can partner with you to do that. Uh, several alumni have done that over the years <clears throat> quite successfully. And we issue a certificate uh, jointly branded by your consulting company or whatever it is and Fielding to people who participate. So those are the sort of big things. We also do some, occasionally do some organizational consulting and where it would be helpful to you to have a partner, to have a university partner such as Fielding, uh, we can do that too. So um, just a quick note on the program. We have one uh, change. Um, Kathleen Edelman was not able to uh, be with us and present today, so she will not be presenting. Uh, <clears throat> she's uh, she's well and okay, but just uh, things didn't work out. So uh, we will have an initial presentation uh, from uh, Teresa Southam and Marie Sonnet on a project that is near and dear to my heart and to their hearts and their heads and their broken backs at times. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Um, about uh, the book that they have co-edited uh, along with Patrice Rosenthal uh, and that is um, for sale here at session. Oh, somebody is showing it. Yeah. <laughs> Yay, hooray, thank you. Uh, at the, uh, at the uh, alumni table. Um, and of course is available on um, Amazon and probably lots of other places, but I'll let them talk about that. So they're gonna start. Then we're gonna have a presentation from Carrie Spell Hansen on her work in women in leadership positions. It's very exciting stuff, very good stuff. Uh, we will then uh, go to Maria Sanchez, who is going to do a presentation on her longstanding work and her dissertation on female genital mutilation, uh, a, a very, very important and difficult subject uh, to, to think about and work on. And finally, Sid Sergeant will uh, talk to us about his exciting work on making healthy open systems. Um, the way we're gonna run this is that we will switch over to each presenter to make them co-hosts and they'll run their, their presentations uh, themselves. And uh, that it's up to each of them. I, the first one will be a little bit different. I'm not quite sure what Marie, Marie and Teresa are doing uh, yet, but we'll find out. But for those of you, uh, the others, you decide whether you want people to ask questions while you're presenting, during your, you know, raise their hands or something, or just wait till you're done and then take Q&A. It's up to you, whatever works best for you. So any questions? Okay, um, I think we're ready to turn it over to 
Teresa and Marie. And I'll pass this over to you. Well, good morning, everyone. This is Marie Sonnet. And I see Teresa saw them there. I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And Teresa, you're in, remind us. I'm in Nelson, British Columbia, Canada. Yes, yes, yes. We are going to, our presentation will start with me giving a little background on how this came to be, this ISI sponsored project of book publication. And then Teresa is going to lead us in a discussion about what we discovered as a key asset in, 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 at the Institute for Social Innovation that we want to extol and encourage. So I'm going to start with the telling of our story, if I might. So first of all, good morning to all. Um, I do want to tell you a story about the um, ISI Book Project, Driving Social Innovation, just published in November, was developed. It really is a story of true collaboration between 16 fellows, Dr. McClintock, our faculty co-editor, um, Dr. Patrice Rosenthal, and Dr. Isbouts, director of the Fielding University Press, and now with other wonderful staff members like Kaylin Staten, who's in the room there, the director of marketing. So nearly two years ago, we can hardly believe it, Teresa and I talked about wanting to work together on a research and writing project. I had previously co-edited a Fielding monograph with Dr. Connie Corley on resilience, and Teresa was familiar with a group writing project where authors produce chapters around a theme. So we thought about how there are 70 Institute for Social Innovation fellows. And if we proposed a theme around the ISI purpose, increasing social justice and sustainability, we could perhaps attract authors for a Fielding University Press monograph. During the COVID era, we were both struck by with how the disruption of precarity and hardship could actually give rise to greater social justice. We saw a need to describe this as happening, however, with a different kind of leadership than what we found in conventional and classic leadership models, which frankly were proving inadequate during the COVID response. And we thought this kind of leading could be all around us, yet unrecognized or appreciated. And maybe our ISI colleagues would be interested in exploring leading through precarity towards great, toward greater social justice. We wrote a project proposal, submitted it to Dr. McClintock, who graciously gave his approval, and later, critically, noticed insightfully that the type of leadership we were discussing was unexpected leadership rather than formal or positional leading. And this was a conceptual breakthrough for us. Our full book title is Driving Social Innovation, How Unexpected Leadership is Transforming Society. In order to go to the Fielding University Press, we needed to have a book proposal with a competitive purpose, a summary of chapters, and a promise to market the book. And there, there are Kaylin Staten partner is, is, so, is uh, so important. So please buy our book. It's available at the book table for a low, low price of just $15, which includes a small but nonetheless significant donation to the McClintock Family Scholarship Fund. We needed to find our ISI, no, so now we needed to find our ISI authors interested in research and practice in this area. Dr. McClintock helped us to reach out and ask fellows to send us a chapter proposal. And we also wanted a faculty co-editor who would bring needed expertise. Dr. Tracy Wilson initially agreed to work with us and we began that process, but she left fielding and unfortunately, but Dr. Rosenthal graciously joined us. So we accepted proposals for nine chapters plus two that Teresa and I would write with our co-authors. And some of our authors are with us today in the room uh, and online. Uh, my co-author is Reed Spearman. I don't know if Reed is there in the room, but he is he is uh, at that session. He made it. Uh, uh, with their chapter summaries, we created a book proposal to be reviewed by Dr. Isbouts and Dr. Rogers. They accepted the proposal in May of 2021, and off we were to an intense year of research, writing, editing, and formatting in collaboration with fellows around the world. So in addition to read Jim Marlott, Gail Wilson, Larry Gephardt, Kate McAlpine, Janine, Jean Lee Weeks Parker, Maggie Butley, Buckley, David Haddad, Kathleen Curran, Randall Thompson, Dominique Eugene, 
uh, Miyasha Driver Woods, Latonya Harrison, Julie Smenzik, O'Brien, we produced our book. Two major takeaways from our project. First, unexpected leadership accessible to everyone can advance social justice during precarious times, particularly when social justice is defined as increasing human capabilities. This is a model from Martha Nussbaum that we used in our work. Second, our Institute for Social Innovation is a treasure trove of talent, drive, and purpose. And working together as fellows, we can foster research and practice that indeed advances social justice and sustainability. So I'm gonna invite Teresa now to help us think together about this ISI asset of collaboration that we leveraged for our book. Teresa? Good morning, everybody. It's so nice to see you virtually out there. Maria and I are so disappointed not to be there in person. However, it's nice that we can join in this way. And thank you for facilitating that, uh, Charles and Gina. Thanks for your help too. Yeah, so the, uh, such a good job Marie did of describing the initial impulse that drove us to do this work. As Charles says, it was hard work. And um, but so we, you need something to sustain you. And what sustained us throughout was this idea of leveraging a network, being part, an active part of a network. So what we thought we could do to continue on here, now that you know about our book, you know where it is, you know where you can obtain it, uh, and you know a little bit about the process, we thought we would talk about where we can go next because that's where our minds are turning. We are working on the marketing of the book, but we're also thinking about where would we like to be next in this network that we both belong to, Marie and I. And what we've been thinking about is where we can take this together with other fellows who might want to work with us. So we're going to propose a think, pair, share. And for the think, pair, share, um, that involves a little bit of uh, personal reflection, followed by turning to somebody in the room as a pair, and then sharing out to the group. And mm -hmm. I'm just going to put in the chat uh, what our prompts will be. So what I'd like you to do, if you have uh, your computer there, or you have pen and paper, better yet, it's always great to use uh, older technology, a pen and paper, I want you to be thinking about a network that you've been a part of. It can be a professional network, it can be a, a volunteer network that you're part of, a family network that you're part of. And what I, I'm going to give you just a minute to think about it, how you are the richer for being part of that network. What do you contribute to the network and what do you receive? So we'll just take uh, a minute now and, and have you think about that and jot down some ideas. I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute people that are online. I'm just going to mute you all right now. Okay, just a few more seconds here. Note down any contributions you make to a network, anything that you have received. Okay, now what we'd like you to do is uh, share that with somebody in the room or here. I'm going to create some breakout rooms. Uh, I'm gonna put you into pairs for five minutes and please share with the person that you are with uh, would you please share the contributions you're making to a network 
and what you're receiving from that network. I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Okay, there you go. Everybody getting their invite to the breakout rooms? No. <laughs> okay, let's try one more time. How about there? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Teresa.
couple more minutes and if we could just wrap up, um, if you could be thinking in your groups about the main contributions that you were able to give to the network and what you received so you could share that with the larger group, that would be wonderful. I see not everybody joined a group and then some got left by themselves and apologize for any of that that happened. I will just give it another minute and then we'll come back into the larger group. Okay, we'll bring our participants back from their pairs. Okay, what I'm going to propose is a popcorn style, just two or three nuggets, uh, something that you heard uh, when you worked with your pair that really was an amazing thing about a contribution that you were able to give to a network or something that you received from a network. Does anybody want to pop up and let us know either from the room? I think with um, the computer, Charles or Gina, we'll have to turn your unmute you so we can hear from the from the room. There, yeah, they're unmuted, perfect. All right, does anybody wanna pop in with a contribution they heard or something they received? You'll have to unmute yourself if you're online as well because I muted everybody. Yes. Uh, in our breakout room, Caitlin asked me to take the lead on that, and it'll dovetail with uh, uh, with Marie and Teresa uh, in in uh, advocating for our book. And so I'm one of the chapter authors uh, who wrote about leadership in small communities. And my my example of uh, networking and collaboration is around forming a refugee support organization. Uh, named Bridges Idaho that we formed in 2016. And that organization has sustained, uh, grown. Uh, we've built our bank account, put a lot of money into helping individual ref meet uh, refugee immediate needs uh, that are, you know, personal, family, uh, health, housing, cars, education, and then the value of meeting refugees, hearing their stories, and then uh, gathering in a you know sort of family type settings where uh, a refugee is willing to share their uh, amazing uh, menus of of ethnic foods and culture and so on. So it's a mutual uh, mutual benefit uh, that that we've uh, developed, and that you know that continues. We have a whole group of Afghan refugees, ones who came in the emergency uh, evacuation uh, a year and a half ago or so. Uh, and, and that's an interesting thing here on our community. So anyway, that's my little contribution to this uh, networking and then a plug to uh, read about the other amazing stories that are in the chapters in uh, Driving Social Innovation, our new fielding book. Thanks, Larry. And especially in your chapter, if you're interested in community work, uh, Larry's chapter is amazing. You can learn about many other kinds of networks that he's part of and the contributions he's made and the gains that he's realized from being part of those networks. Uh, anybody else? One or two more? Yes. Being part of a network, what does that mean to you? It looks like Sylvie is, uh, wants to say something. Just have to unmute yourself. Yeah, sure, Reed, go for it. All right. And then Sylvie. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Reed Spearman, and my partner in this uh, exercise was Dr. Tracy Long. Tracy is a scholar practitioner in the area of public art, and our conversation was about uh, it goes back to the fact that we're in, in crisis in many of our systems, uh, where you talk about education, you talk about leadership, governance, finance, we're in crisis in many of the systems that have existed for so long and they're breaking down. 
And one of the, one of the things that we see, uh, we saw it in our research chapter one of the new Minecraft, um, no plug, uh, is the development of organic groups, not really organizations. There is some organization to them, but they, are, they form organically. We don't really know how this happens. They come together to resolve or solve an issue or a problem. And then some of them just melt away because they take care of it. In some cases, uh, on my, my part of our, our team was the, the, um, the group here at Field we call the Paradigm Shifter, which is an organic, self-organizing group to help doctoral students through the process. So it's another example of an organic kind of organization, a new thing in organizational development. And we think that they're beginning to pop up. We see them popping up because of its failure of systems. Thank you, Reed. Okay, I saw that Sylvie had her hand up. I, I'm trying to watch the Hollywood Squares here. And uh, would you like to be, make the last comment, Sylvie? Yes, well, in the brief conversation and that I had with Mary Lee Adams, which I really appreciated, she talked about uh, a number of networks that she is a part of at the intersection of leadership and speaking and facilitation. And this made me realize how not only participating in networks is valuable uh, for ourselves and other participants, but our ability to create bridges across these different networks is also valuable. So thanks, Mary Lee, for sharing that. That makes sense. Thank you. That's a really wonderful and important point. So um, we're on a bit of a time here just to make sure that all the other presenters get uh, their time. So what I'd like to leave you with is this, uh, that Marie and I would like to meet with Dr. McClintock and a few of you if you're interested uh, so that we can plan out potentially uh, the contributions and the needs of the ISI network. So kind of working like we asked the authors to do in our book and, and that Reed so eloquently just pointed out to see if the network itself can identify the contributions that we have to make to each other and the needs that we might have, and the re reasons that drove us to be part of the network. We're thinking about planning a uh, event, something like a liberating structure like social network webbing. So there are these structures that you can use to kind of start to talk about the kind of contributions you'd like to make to the ISI network and the needs that you might have. So if you're interested in planning something like that, or you would like to be more actively involved in the ISI network in a more horizontal way, um, please be in touch with us, Marie or I. You can email Marie and I, and we'll coordinate with Charles and see if we can put a bit of a small group together to do some planning. So that would be our next steps. Um, we'd love to hear from some of you so that it's not just Marie and I doing this work and not because of the work itself, but because if we involve more of you, we'll do a better job, I think. Um, so yeah, please be in touch. Um, our email addresses, we're still, Marie and I still using the fielding email addresses on a regular basis. So it would just be our, our first msonnet at email.fielding.edu and tsouthern at email.fielding.edu. So I'll put those into the um, chat and thank you for the time and go ahead, Marie, with a last plug. Just thank you so much to all of our co-authors and to all the ISI network and to, uh, and to you, Charles. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks. Actually, Just a tip, we need the um, camera to just go up a little bit, Gina, because we're just seeing uh, Charles. We don't see Charles's face and we always like to see, there he is, yay. There you are. Right, Perfect. I can't see what you're seeing right now. Yeah, we see you perfectly now. It's perfect. Which I guess means people online can. Oh, thank you. It should be good. Okay. Well, I thank you both again uh, for. Actually, I'm amazed that we pulled this off technically. So uh, thank you for <laughs> making it happen. Um, and one of the one of the projects for the coming year with ISI is to uh, work with fielding, to come up with something, I don't know if we would call it an app or not. Actually, I think I'll take this off. 
uh, I don't know if we call it an app, but something that will promote uh, easier networking uh, among the, the ISI fellows. And it could be, it could be beyond that as well. So we're, we're thinking about that and uh, we're pushing the university and all of its unusual wealth that it has to throw around, you know, uh, to see if we can get something like this going. They would have general use beyond the fellows too. So we're gonna move on to our next presenter, uh, Dr. Carrie Spell Hansen, who has been doing a lot of interesting work on women in leadership, uh, including uh, international uh, uh, investigations. And so Carrie, if you are ready to go. Yes, I am. Thank you very much. There you okay. are. All right, you're, you're on. Okay, so I'm going to... I'm going to put my slides up and obviously I have to get accustomed to hearing the reverberation of my voice, but I'm sure that I'll get used to it just as uh, Teresa and, and Marie was able to do. So that being said, let me go ahead and put my slides up. How is that? Is that better? Carrie, are you physically close to the computer um, that Charles has? Um, actually, I'm using my own computer. Perhaps I should. Perhaps I should be on that one instead. Okay. So I will sit and I will put mine up. <laughs> my slides up. Great background. Thank you. Actually, that, that is a background that I created for the work that I do with women. So if you have an opportunity to read it, and if you're interested in it, just send me an email and I will send it to you. I, I have been distributing that. Is that better? Yes. Okay, excellent. Yeah. We just have to minimize all of this. Here we go. Look at this. Okay, so thank you. Welcome, everyone. So my research, my dissertation research was on on women in leadership positions and how do women how do women thrive in the face of lack of respect. And so the uh, what so my ISI project is actually an extension of my research. I, I focus. I interviewed twenty four women for the research project for the dissertation, and uh, all of the women were either born or raised in the United States. So there was the culture was then the the U S culture, and uh, and they also worked for organizations that were primarily based in the United States. Although some of them did also work abroad. Because of the work that I do, cross-cultural, intercultural, diversity, equity, inclusion, and such, and my work with women, I became interested in understanding. Thank you. It's on. Anyway, so I don't know if this is more helpful. Is it? How's that? Can you hear me better in the room now? Okay, excellent. So. As I was saying that um, my work, my dissertation work was based, was focused on women. I interviewed 24 women. And to me, the significance of my research was number one was my own personal and professional experience as a woman of African descent and having worked in organizations up to the level of a senior vice president, I found that it was very challenging and yet I was able to succeed. And, and again, the, 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 the concept of my research was how do, what is the, the I'd like to call it the secret sauce what is the, the characteristic that, that supports women in succeeding where other women were unable to succeed in environments where they, they, these barriers exist? There's, I found that there was a limited amount of research focused on the role of respect in organizations. Also that the lack of research on the intrinsic barriers that hinder women from advancing to or remaining in leadership positions. So the rationale for my study then was to, how do you create an environment where women feel welcomed and can contribute their best required their best requires an understanding of respect and inclusion. And again, there's a great deal of emphasis on the extrinsic barriers that prevent women from advancing to or remaining in leadership positions. And it's equally important to examine in my eye, my view was that it's equally 
important to examine and strengthen women's intrinsic characteristics, such things as resilience, self-respect, self-confidence, and self-esteem. And this is a good example of what I'm talking about. When you think globally, look at this photo. This is like pretty amazing. How many women do you see? <laughs> okay. So, and this is what it looks like uh, when you, when also when you look in, at the five Fortune 500 companies, we know now what women make up roughly 8%. And I actually, you know, in, in the interest of time, I won't share a lot of my, um, my my research, but the eight percent out of out of the Fortune 500 companies, and that has increased had increased since 1968, and and um, until last year, because up until then it it may, pretty much plateaued at six percent, and it remained at six percent from 1950, 1968 when Fortune 500 started collecting the data until 2021 when two additional women were were uh, uh, promoted to CEO to the C suite. And we did not lose women because usually it's like a rotating um, situation. That's what's been happening. So that, so what I did with my research then it, and my ISI research was like, when I looked at the women and the incredible feedback that I received from the 24 women based on their experience in corporations and companies and what we call the secret sauce and what we found, I started thinking then, is this... Is, is the characteristics that the intrinsic characteristics that these women exhibited to be successful. I wonder if it's the same for women internationally that are in global positions. So what I'm doing for ISI and I have IRB approval now, I'm interviewing women from South Africa and also Australia and Germany. I'm looking at, and we'll probably have some more because through the um, I, it was an International Leadership Association, ILA, as a member there, I'm, I'm having the opportunity to speak with other women. And I just returned from Prague, had some conversations there, and I'll be speaking to some women in Sweden when I'm there in a few, in a, uh, in a couple of months. So I'm, I'm actually looking at, and I'm probably gonna interview somewhere between 10 and 15 women over the next two months. And, uh, and what I'm looking at is, are these characteristics that supported them in being successful comparable or the same as the women in, in, the, in, in the US that were successful? And my research question continues to be the same with the slight distinction of this being global women. What are the factors that impact the resiliency of women, global leaders this time that experience disrespect in the workplace? So I, when I started my research, my conceptual framework looked like this, and, I, and I'm a visual person, so I had to come up with a framework. And my conceptual framework was there are the intrinsic dimensions and the extrinsic dimensions that we're dealing with. So the intrinsic um, aspect of my model is self-respect. Okay, that means that the individual, the women in this case, um, had an internal checklist that might include something like worth, value, I deserve or I don't deserve to be respected. The extrinsic dimension, on the other hand, was the aspect in the, of the individual's perception of their experiences with the group or the organization and how they interpreted that, that the organization, how the organization perceived them. So that might be something like the policies and procedures that were in place, how, how they were treated, the visual, verbal, and vocal communication exchanges with, with individuals, and then the frequent or infrequent in interaction with others. So after my research, and, the, and the, this was like, I would say over the period of a year and then grappling with the, the qualitative research and, and, and whatnot in the data, I was, I toward the end of my dissertation, I realized that my model had changed. And this is what the current model looks like now, the, it, which is the dis, uh, respect, disrespect and resilience. And what I learned and what I found was uh, the intrinsic dimension, which of course is the, uh, the respect that is the individual's perception of respect, okay, is based on, and they are influ the influences that shape those dimensions. So that could be people, for example, like a strong family and extended family role models, um, the, their intimate partners, the, the supportive social networks, networks that they had, the educators who were encouraging them. The other thing, and I'm not reading all of those because you can read, certainly see them on the uh, slide. The circumstances was also fascinating because growing up sometimes in a distressed neighborhood, oftentimes we think that that may have, that will always have a negative impact on people. That's not necessarily the case. Sometimes it gives them the, the fortitude or the resilience, if you will, to bounce back in, in the face of, of, of adversity. Also things like um, um, early death of a parent, uh, parents divorcing, 
again, we think that that will oftentimes with the, we go to, it's gonna have a negative impact. That was not necessarily the case with some of the women that I interviewed, found that really fascinating. And then the, so what happens is those influences shape the in, intrinsic dimension, meaning that uh, their concept of worth, value, self-efficacy, do they or they don't, don't they deserve um, uh, to be respected or to continue with it, regardless of what the barriers were that they were facing. So if they felt like they deserved it, then of course the resilient behavior at work would, would result in, they bounce back, okay? And they said that worth to them was faith, spirituality, the ability to speak up, and also feeling that they they had a right to defend themselves and 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 they had a determined mindset that they were going to succeed. They also the value to them was they had self confidence. They demonstrated the value and they took what we call I call the shiro's posture. In other words, you know what I'm here. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm here and I deserve respect. So that's to me what I call the shiro's posture. And then the self efficacy, meaning that. I know who I am and I bring value. So respect me, regardless of what was going on. Excuse me. <clears throat> they also said um, deserve they um, not backing down when they were disrespected, articulating the impact of others' disrespectful behavior. In other words, saying to someone, calling them out and in a respectful manner, but letting them know, thank you. Um, calling them out, letting them know that this doesn't work for me. Okay, I have a right to be respected. So can you say that differently, please? And also have knowledge and experience of, um, I've paid my dues. I'm in a senior leadership position. No one gave me this job. I didn't wake up one day and they go, wow, well, you look great. We should give it to you. I worked, I paid my dues. So respect me. I have a right to be here. Now, what, what was interesting, if they, they did not feel like they deserved it, okay, the lack of resilient behavior would, would exist. So that's, that, that was what I found. And then we said disrespect recurs when there's a discrepancy between the intrinsic dimension and the extrinsic dimension of the behavior. So the extrinsic dimension, on the other hand, is that uh, goes back to what I had in my um, for my original model, which is that the policies and the procedures, how they how I'm being treated, I don't deserve to be treated differently. So that was so. This is the model that I'm currently using, and the model that I will be interviewing the women globally against this model, because the goal globally, the distinction between my dissertation research and this research is how do, do women in leadership position globally fare against this model? Does the model change? So that's basically what, um, what the, the research will, will share with me. And that's, that's it. That's what I'd like to share today. And I can go on and on. Thank you. Any questions, comments? about the international experience. Mm -hmm. And my guess is it's not going to differ. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Regardless of the language that we speak. Yes. Right, right. But then even with collective collectivist and individualistic, in terms of me and my intrinsic, you know, desire of, of you know, to, to succeed, do I think if we're thinking from a collectivistic standpoint, does that mean that my family comes first and that's important? So if I'm disrespected at work, that's okay. You know what I mean? Like, so it, I, I'm really, I'm also the reason why I'm doing it. I'm passionate. I'm fascinated by it. So. Good. Okay. Good. Yeah, thank you. Well, what, what was the uh, I'm sorry, say that again. Can you um, mute yourself here? We're not hearing anything, dear friends. Okay, here we go. If I'm muted, then they're unable to hear me on 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 the video. So uh, the question, what I'm what I'm doing is uh, through my networking, and then also, okay, 
through my networking. And then also, um, I'm, a, I'm a fellow with the um, Respect Research Institute at the, at the University of Hamburg in Germany. So I have that. And then just again, networking and, um, and I travel extensively internationally working. So I have the opportunity to talk to women and share with them that this is the work that I'm doing. And there's, a, and, there's and, and wherever I go and whoever I talk to, there's a great deal of interest in it. And you have certain experience when I uh, work to cover it by friends. Oh, would love to. So you, I've, I've worked with some of them and I remember one of the things that you shared. I was so stunned that I felt that we are really like, Compared what I witnessed the experience mm -hmm, mm -hmm. was much more than I, I could imagine. And but yes, someone who is like senior vice president stole by defeat Brenda Corbyn because she's a woman. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I would. I, we like should. Course. We should exchange. We should exchange because I would love to. To um, I, and um, even with some of the women, some of the stories that I heard, and I'll just share one. I'm in my dissertation. By the way, my dissertation. I'm actually I'm going to be I'm publishing a book with the dissertation for practice, practical, and I'm also looking at it from the standpoint as, as a, a research book too, because the the information is so incredible. But just to share one one example, I actually had um, one of the women said that a very small petite woman, probably probably around five one, she said that she was uh, in the C-suite, had an event, and her boss said uh, her boss told uh, he was supposed to attend and he was unable to, and she thought. Well, you know, like with me, that what happened this morning is a crisis when you run an organization. So she just assumed that was why he wasn't there. He, uh, she said, when she was on her way back to the C-suite, the boss, the CEO, and the COO was walking toward her. She was walking down the hallway, and she said he was red. He was furious, and she was like, "Oh my gosh, whatever happened? Why he didn't make the meeting was obviously really bad." And when he got to her, he said he was so angry because she didn't give him the right information to attend the meeting. And he said, I should kick your A blah, blah, blah. And she looked at him and she said, no, she, he said, I should punch you in the face. Uh -oh. And she said, to, and she looked at him and she said, you do that and I will kick your A blah, blah, blah. And I started laughing. She said, oh no, I'm a black belt. Okay, but you, you see the thing is like, but women, where does that come from? Where as some women would just be like appalled, start crying, you know, like get, and she just immediately came back with, so. That's what I'm looking at. Those kinds of that 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 intrinsic. No, you don't, and no, you won't. Yeah. You know, where does that come from, and does it vary in, in different cultures? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? And I don't. Are there any questions from online or? Yes, we have a couple of hands up for you. Okay, so I can't see them. Be can someone else? Well, I I'll stop sharing. Let me stop sharing. I'll do that. Okay. Don't stop sharing. Okay. So, go ahead. Since no one's calling on me, I'll just call on myself. This is Dr. Neen. Hi, Dr. Carey. Hi there. I wanted to know. <laughs> I wanted to know if when you were interviewing the women, if any of them um, were introspective enough to say that they were shocked by the answers they had for the questions that you asked them? That's an excellent question. And the answer is absolutely. In fact, some of them said that they hadn't even thought about it as disrespect. They, and they couldn't, even, they couldn't even define, initially couldn't even define or, or characterize what respect or disrespect was, except as it, it, and they did, they were able to do so during the interviewing process. And then one woman had just recently, after 20 years, senior VP had been let had been terminated. And, and at the end of the interview, she said that the interview was very helpful in supporting her in understanding who she was and that she would bounce back. And by the way, she is now, she's now an EVP of an organization, but she said that just going through that, having the opportunity to be reminded that of who she was, having had children and everything, you, she lost sight of that and, and was comfortable in her job as a vice president. And the fact that she lost a job and was just like stuck there, that she was able to bounce back as a result of being reminded. And again, and many of them said that, um, that this research is essential and needs to be out there because it will support women and moving and forward. I'll, thank you so much for that. And I'll just jump in since um, you can't see the hands up as well. Um, it's been very fascinating to hear the research that you're working on. And I'm loving it because essentially 
one of the things that I grapple with so many decades now is that basically I went back for my doctorate program thinking that's going to give a level of respect and appreciation. But one thing I didn't hear you mention about is um, how color plays its role on here. Um, because essentially I've spent the past year in, in Cape Town, South Africa. And as, as has always been the case, wherever I go, there's constantly a need to show that I, they see the credentials, but then they see me and they try to discredit the credentials from you know, lay people to professionals. There's always that second guessing of who you are, who are the credentials that you're working with. Um, and I just wanted to find out, did you come across any of that being a factor for the women that were struggling to make sure that the identity is, is respected or the professionalism is respected? Absolutely. And in, in fact, um, you know, my, my, my dissertation is on open source, and I know most people don't read dissertations, but it is on open source. And as I said, and that's one of the reasons why we, I'm go, it will be in a book as well for people to hear and see some of that. And, and even from my own personal experience uh, as a woman, and, you know, with my PhD, I have five degrees right now. That means nothing. OK, what it does mean to me is that, you, you know what, I like I will go in any room and I'm very comfortable speaking with anybody from chair people to staff stockholders to presidents of, of whatever. And I'm, I'm comfortable with myself because I know who I am. But that's that resiliency piece. And what my goal here is we can teach this. OK, it's a skill. It's not something that you're born with. You don't like, you know, it's not like a moly that you have in your brain. It can be taught. And in response to what you said, I mean, I've actually taught a group of, of senior VPs, all white males, and, and one of them put on the evaluation that I was too sure of myself. Exactly. I thought that was a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> so I get it, I get it. But that's that intrinsic character, but those are the intrinsic characteristics that I'm talking about. Okay, that we, the barriers exist, we can talk about that and we do, we explore, we research the, the external barriers or the extrinsic barriers and, and that's important. To me, we also have to focus on developing those internal characteristics that is going to make a difference. Okay, that's where I'm coming from. How do we get women to understand that, you know what, we can, we're blasting those barriers. That's the goal. So that's it. Any other questions? Oh, and I'll leave you with this. Okay, go ahead. Oh, that, oh, that's me. Okay. Oh, I wanted to leave you with this quote. Um, leadership work is just that. It's holding both sides and valuing both. It's the precise, disciplined, and curious scientist and the aware and gifted storyteller. It honors the masculine and the feminine. The feminine is needed not because it trumps the masculine, but because it has been missing from the necessary partnerships of the two leadership dimensions. And that to me is important because we're not talking about, let's do away with men so that women can be in charge. We're not, no, 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 no. We need balance. And that's, that's the, the crux of the work that I do. It's about the balance. It's bringing it all to the table. So with that being said, I'm gonna say thank you for your time and I'm done. Very awesome. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Carrie. Okay. I don't know if you can see me from online. <laughs> I may turn my back to you. Um, one of the things that I love about Carrie's work, and uh, she exemplifies the kind of thing that I always struggle with students on when I was more here. She's got a creative, great, conceptual prayer. And uh, that is the foundation of any good inquiry. So then you model because it's exactly what Paul students here sort of struggle with and hopefully trying to get together for this so thank you so much. And we look forward to um hearing you know, when you're ready hearing the results of your international group yet thank you. We want you to publish this too with Okay, um, so we're going to move on to Maria Sanchez. Uh, Maria has a, a very, very important topic. It's it's a difficult topic. She and I have been going back and forth about her slides. <laughs> Some of them may be difficult, but we're just giving you fair warning to that. 
uh, but she will handle it uh, in a fully professional way, I'm sure. So um, if we're ready to go and she's ready to go, we're ready to go, Maria, you're on. Thank you, Dr. McClintock. And what a perfect presentation for me to follow. Thank you for being here. Well <laughs> I apologize. Do I need to back up? Yes, you do. Yay. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think I am going to try it. Oh, I guess it's not. Uh, okay, so the reason that female genital mutilation is a concern for me, and it has been for decades, is because it affects so many women in the planet on this world, not only internationally, but nationally. And uh, I kept expecting that the United Nations, the World Health Organization, UNICEF would do something about it. And they just talk about it and they say how terrible it is. And the United Nations has a day, every February 6th is called the International Day for Zero Tolerance of Female Genital Mutilation. I was there in February of 2020 at the United Nations and there was less than a hundred of us in the room. It just isn't getting the awareness that it needs to be. So that's why I've taken it on myself, upon myself to do so. So I am not, click here. So this is the number of females who are alive today that have endured female genital mutilation, 200 million. So we're not talking about something that is a small population. Every 11 seconds somewhere in the world, a girl is being cut. So this is the description of female genital mutilation. It involves four different types of procedures that remove all or part of a female's external genitalia, and it is not medically or religiously mandated. You can see this is from UNICEF in 2020. These are the four types, uh, well, three, well, and I'll get into that, of mutilation. There's type one, type two, and type three. So type one, is called a clitoridectomy. It's the partial or total removal of the clitoris and or the clitoral hood. Type two involves the partial or total removal of the clitoris and the labia minora, and it may include the excision of the labia majora. It's called excision. Type three, the vaginal opening is sealed by cutting and repositioning the labia with or without the excision of the clitoris. A tiny opening is created for urination and menstruation. It's known as infibulation. And when I say tiny opening, it's the size of a Q-tip or the size of a eraser on a pencil. After three, they bind the girl's feet and legs and they keep her that way for seven to 10 days so that the scarring can occur. Type four is all other harmful procedures to the female genital genitalia for non-medical purposes. And that includes pricking, piercing, incising, scraping, and cauterization. And again, these are the three types type one, type two, type three. Type four in, involves, as I mentioned, the pricking. So on the right are the instruments that are used. They're usually rusty razor blades, shards of glass, scissors. It's done without anesthesia. 
It's done in unsanitary conditions and it's been around for centuries. It predates the introduction of Islam and Christianity and it's not required by any religion. 92 countries have cut populations and interestingly, more than 50% of those live in Indonesia, Egypt and Ethiopia. Globally, 3.9 million girls are forced to undergo FGM annually. And of course, there's no consent. The age of the girls is six months to 15 years of age and mostly before they're the age of five. I've spoken to survivors of female genital mutilation and those that can remember it, recall it as the most horrific, painful, usually they black out thing that has ever happened to them. And one of the terrible parts about this is that it's the women of their cultures, countries that perpetuate it. So I spoke with this one survivor. She said, as they were holding me down because they hold down each limb to get no resistance. And one of the women was my mother. And I looked at her and I said, you brought me into this planet. You gave me life. You're the one that should be protecting me, not assaulting me. So the health consequences, they're short-term and long-term. I'll let you look over that. But you can imagine the pain, the bleeding, especially with type three, the ability to urinate and menstruate is tremendous. And then when they get married and they have intercourse, that usually involves a lot of bleeding and often hospitalizations. And why does it exist? So it's believed to increase marriageability, to make sure that you're marrying a virgin, to sublimate a woman's sexuality. They think that the clitoris is dirty, so they think it improves hygiene and perpetuate traditions, passages. They say that once you've been cut, you're now a woman. Is it religiously mandated? I interviewed this man, he's Iman Mohammed Majid. He's an, the executive imam. He's located in Virginia in the United States, but originally from Sudan. And in our interview, he stated that Prophet Muhammad did not do this to his daughters. Harm in Islam is not permissible. Do not harm. There's an organization here in the United States. It's Muslim, Muslim Women Lawyers for Human Rights. And they did a white paper uh, several years ago and in it, it states, that Islam does not mandate FGM or any practice that causes harm to a person's health and dignity. So people say, oh, well, that happens over there. Well, I'm here to tell you, no, it happens here in the United States. And I realize that some of our visitors might be international, but I'm bringing it down to the United States since we're located in the United States. It's estimated that over half a million girls have experienced female genital mutilation in the United States, and that's an underreport because most of these numbers come from people. The women, when they present themselves to their healthcare providers, suddenly they're told they've been cut and they're like, what? And I, I, this is the way I've always been. And they're like, no, you've been cut. So uh, in January 5 of 20. 21, and it got no notoriety because of what happened the next day. Uh, a law, a federal law was signed called the Stop FGM Act of 2020. And what it did was it clarified what is the crime of it and to allow our definition of it in the United States to be that of the World Health Organization. And it increased the penalty from five to 10 years. So if someone, parent, caregiver is found guilty of it, they go to prison. However, we have 10 states in the District of Columbia in the United States that have no legislation outlining it. And those are Alabama, Alaska, Connecticut, the District of Columbia, Hawaii, Maine, Mississippi, Montana, New Mexico, Vermont, and Washington, which means ostensibly that you can get cut in the 10 states in the District of Columbia. Now it's a federal fence to cross state lines because of the federal act, but if you live in one of those states, you can cut. So interestingly, that the highest numbers of at-risk girls and women live in New York, the DC area, Minneapolis, St. Paul, the Los Angeles area, 
and the Seattle, Washington area. Seattle being one of the states, Washington being one of the states that doesn't have legislation and the District of Columbia. So another number is that it's doubled between 2000 and 2014 and it's quadrupled since 1997. Yes. There is a huge immigrant population there. Yeah. Female genital mutilation is not taught in medical school. And this is a, a quote from them, the American Cattle Academy of Pediatrics. There's no teaching required for the healthcare providers. Part of my outreach with my foundation is that I train medical professionals on what it is and what to look for. And I say, I'm not a physician, so that, that's not, but at least what when you see it, you know what you're looking at. And then in California, because we're in California, California has the highest number of cut girls in the United States. So they estimate 57,000 girls are living in the United States that have been cut. And then these the, on the left are the countries that they come from and where they immigrated to in the state of California. I won't go into all of those details, but California's legislation needs to get sharper. We've been given a C grade because we do have legislation outlawing it, but we need to state that it's culture is not a defense and that vacation cutting, which is a term used for parents who take their children out of the United States that we as Californians need to say it's illegal. The government says it's illegal. And I'm actually working with uh, assembly members to make that legislation happen. And this is my inspiration. A dream doesn't become reality through magic. It takes sweat, determination, and hard work. And this with the World Health Organization, female genital mutilation is a violation of human rights. Others consider it child abuse, violence against women. And because of this, I founded this foundation, Stop the Cut Now, Eradicating Female Genital Mutilation. The IRS granted us tax exempt status in September of last year. So we're on Amazon Smile and PayPal and Facebook. And it's been interesting because each one of those organizations had to vet Stop the Cut Now. And ironically and interestingly and surprisingly, Facebook asked us to go through the most arduous of tasks to verify that we were who we said we were, which I was like, wow, okay, they're getting their act together. <laughs> Uh, and that's it. That's my email address and my personal cell phone number. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. So that's what our foundation is trying to do is because my dissertation was on the eradication of female genital mutilation and my data and research showed that all it takes is awareness. And when people have the awareness, they make the decision not to cut. And so it's getting to the family systems. And it, it really what it takes is money because money is gonna provide the engine for the messaging. And I keep saying, it's really simple. It's not complicated at all. And what weighs on my shoulders all the time, and I shared this with Dr. McClintock the other night, is the figure about every 11 seconds a girl is cut. That's a lot. Yes. Yeah. That's why I had to wait for the taxes. I'm part of it. And then to get vetted by everybody. There's even a millennial site called Raise, R A Y Z E, because millennials only donate now digitally. So they vetted me. So it's, it's happening. And now we can approach the deep pockets. Thank you. Yes. Online, 
So we don't have it on the website, but I have a template for it that I share whenever I've been asked about it. <laughs> okay, well said. Thank you. Happy to share it. Thank you. Hi, I, I have my hand up, but you probably can't okay. see. Okay, please. Um, yes, I, I'm curious. You said something earlier that I'm not sure I caught properly about women, you know, um, promoting uh, the mutilation or leading the charge or something like that. And I had an experience many years ago where I was in hospital in one of those old multi-bed wards and there was an adult woman across from me who was there wanting to have um uh, one day you know she didn't use the word mutilate but have a circumcision or whatever term she used and it's puzzled me for decades and i'm wondering you know it was that an anomaly or does that fit with the research you've done or what was happening there do you think was she requesting it herself yes i'm sorry, I'm sorry. yes Oh, yes, that is uh, an anomaly. Um, so I went to the United Nations on a, another trip because the woman who runs the Sierra Leone was speaking and Sierra Leone has, they call them cut rates. So Somalia has a 98% cut rate, meaning 98% of the girls are cut. Sierra Leone is like 92%, Egypt is 91%. So we're talking prevalent. And after she spoke, I went up to her and I asked about female genital mutilation and she acted as if I had slapped her in the face. She recoiled and her handlers encircled her and said, what do you wanna know? And I said, I wanna know about female genital mutilation in your country. And they said, it doesn't happen. And I said, mm, that's not what I understand. And I said, the only girls who get cut are girls who are 18 years of age or older at their request. And I went back to the United Nations and they said they lie. They lie all the time. No, that's not true. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick comment. May I, Maria? Yes, please. Hi, this is Anita. Thank you so much for your presentation and the tough work that it takes. I know not only the subject matter, but the avenues to try and cut through all the red tape is just yes. really crazy making. I have a, a non-academic contribution to make that may be a great adjunct to your work. And that comes from an unexpected source, Dick Wolf, who is the writer producer of Law and Order, the old television yeah. series. In the chat, I put the episode connection where he did a wonderful uh, episode of dealing with this topic in the United States, in New York, and the difficulties of trying to not only uh, protect a family member from this particular uh, intrusion, but also all the complications that are involved here in the States uh, with the international implications of this. So I recommend that as a non-academic view, but an excellently written item that can help bring this into the public discussion along with your great academic research. Thank you so much. So thank you for sharing. And interestingly enough, Dick Wolf lives here in Santa Barbara. His children did. go to school at a school that my girlfriend does development for. And he's <laughs> so he's I'm gonna be seeing what I can do to contact him. Yeah, I think it <laughs> Cause be it's cool obviously on his radar. Be my guest. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh -huh. This is Dr. Nina, I have a question. Do you already have any documentaries around this topic that you um, have possession of for yourself that um, covers your research? The answer is no. What I did with okay, well, my mm -hmm. uh, dissertation was podcasts. That was the media yes. that was the game changer. Um, mm -hmm. But I definitely would love to do something about it because 
I will contact you then. Most people are ignorant and about it, and honestly um, so. And yeah. as I said, as soon as they find out about it, my research said they want to do either donate, volunteer, <clears throat> share it on social media, or get involved somehow. Nobody wanted to sit on their hands after they heard about it. And that's what gives me hope. It's like, of course, we're just a little organization, but the more we can bang that drum, the I think the more movement we're going to make to eradicate it. Yes, my my client just won two awards for her um, Roe v. Wade documentaries, um, and she's looking for another project. So I will connect the two of you because this is something that um, has been heavy on my heart for the last 25 years because our nonprofit organization worked with women who were victims of domestic abuse. And one of um, the women in the shelters said that she wanted, she was from Somalia and she was talking about her experience and she was saying that he wanted to get it all out in the um, in the open. And definitely what you're saying about them lying about it. She was uh, pretty much <laughs> censored and then <laughs> lost a lot of things um, and ended up coming to the United States because of it. And then even here, her communities, um, they would tell her, you know, you're lying. You're, you're not telling the truth about any of the current situation. So she ended up homeless just once again, people pushing back to saying, don't ever talk about this as right, if it's right. true. Yeah. 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 It's, it's our secret. Our secret. We have another question. Thank you. I would appreciate the connection. Sorry, am I good to go ahead with a question? I had my hand up. Thank you, please. Thank you, please. That's a bit of an echo, but I'll go ahead. Maria, thank you for your work and your advocacy. Um, I'm from Sierra Leone. I agree that FGM is prevalent there on the continent and in other parts of the world, as you as you showed so well. Um, I'm blessed not to be cut due to family advocacy. And the question I had is um, how you're connecting with women from the communities that are cut, that are willing to be part of this work. There are uh, many that I know of that are actively advocating, um, including um, all the way to the UN as you are and in, in other spaces. Um, and the reason I asked the question and want to put it to in, on your radar, if, if you don't yet have those connections, is that where there has been success, it has been with those um, local campaigns, with that kind of local support to the kinds of examples that have been raised, there is a cultural phenomenon that um, when, when the campaigns have been from um, external advocacy or from the health perspective, there's a, there's a kind of blind, blinders around that where it is not fully heard within, as you said, this has happened for millennial uh, and totally with you, not okay. Um, and, and so it's it's culturally entrenched and needs cultural solutions. And I know that where it has been successful, it has been women campaigning with other women within the communities that um, have this pervasive practice. So I can't thank you enough for sharing that because people have said to me, you're a white Western woman, it's none of your business. And you know, and I, I have no intention of being the messenger. All I wanna do is give them the tools so that they can be the boots on the ground in their various communities, looking like they do and speaking like they do and, and being culturally appropriate. Um, it was a woman from Somalia who said to me, I don't care if you're purple, it's child abuse, do something about it, end it. Cause she was cut. She's one of the stories that I talk about. Um, I sit on the advisory board for a foundation that's based here in the United States that does outreach in Liberia. And, the, and one of the other things that she does is um, she funds clitoral restoration surgery, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. exists. A physician in France uh, created it. And there's a woman in San Francisco that does it. And they give their time to do it. The only fee they charge is for the OR or anesthesia or whatever. So she's connected there. I'm connected with her. So little by little, but if anybody as such as you has other connections that then I can piggyback on, I'm 
all R's, I's and R's. Yeah. I would highly Thank encourage you. you. I, I absolutely could see that, that that will happen and it will keep happening. And we'll just encourage you to partner with folks from the communities um, and, and share this load. Uh, and also uh, because of all those concerns that you will, um, you will walk into, you'll walk into those cult cultural concerns. You would walk into the reality um, in, in a world that's looking to decolonize that it's, it's another white, white savior type approach. Um, and so I'm, I'm saying this from, from the perspective of partnering, from the perspective of being in those communities and hearing the conversations um, would encourage you to share the load and work with folks from that, those communities. So seek them out. They're Thank out there. You. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. Can I chat briefly about some of the frustrations you have in more awareness of the issues? What, what's next for you? What do you see? I mean, you've gotten some interesting suggestions today about partnering. What are your what are you going to be doing next week, next month, next year? So I really think it's now down to uh, donations because the and and like a significant one a Mackenzie Scott 100 million one because i really think that that's going to bust us through um and it's not going to happen on on a grant level per se unless they it's a grant that gives you know free range if you will instead of cuz i applied for a grant with the WAP, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and they wanted a specific program so i focused on southern california and Egyptian immigrant, you know, it it was too specific to be generalized. So that's that's my next approach is getting to the table to some folks who can help us be game changers. Thank you very much. Yes, let's give Maria. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your patience with all my anxiety. No, I I love it all. <laughs> Uh, thank you all online too for your your suggestions and your uh, mm -hmm. your comments. We really appreciate uh, being with us. This is very important. Uh, we're going to move to our last presenter, uh, Serge. I think of as um, a systems guy, uh, a metaphor guy, and an improvisational guy, <laughs> and that's a great combination of uh, skills and talents. So we look forward to your. Thank you, Charles. So just checking the audio if it's working also for the people online. I see nods and thumbs up, so that's good. And I should speak up in the room, of course, so without our amplifier, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. First of all, I want to <laughs> express my, um, yeah, I, I don't have words for the presentations I just witnessed. And um, I do realize that the project that I'm going to share it comes from a country and a perspective that is uh, in relation to what I'm hearing. Uh, um, more privileged, I think, and I just want to say that because, um, uh, yeah, making the transition from from such subjects to this is is a bit, <laughs> well. <laughs> um, but having said that, uh, I'm also very enthusiastic to share about my research and work, um, which I will do. <clears throat> I'll share my screen. Uh, I am already sharing my screen, but I'll start a slideshow. So. Uh, my name is Sergei Vinnedorp. I'm a, I'm a field graduate from 2016, and I graduated with a dissertation named Embodying Metaphors in Systems. And since graduating, I've been working with a community in the Netherlands, um, uh, of which I will share a bit more during my presentation. And we framed our action research project uh, with the question, how do we make healthy systems? Um, hoping that what we are learning in the local context of the Dutch healthcare system and the transformation of that system and the digital support that we are offering for that transformation, what we may be learning uh, metaphorically also helps us understand how we make healthy systems in general. 
so that we can uh, interface a local healthcare system with a global challenge. Um, uh, healing our earth, for example, one of the things we are all concerned about, of course, and maybe healing ourselves in relationship to that major challenge. Uh, however, to make it a researchable subject, uh, we also formulated the efforts in a more concrete context. And you see the research question for that concrete context on the top. How do we make NUTS, I'll share more about what NUTS is later, a healthy open source software ecosystem? So that's our practical question. And then the more generic question, how do we make healthy systems? We hope to learn more about that while addressing that question in the specific context. And the interaction between those two questions, of course, is a complex responsive process of inquiry, finding out things, having assumptions, testing those, etc. If you will, in a flowing, <clears throat> in a flowing river of inquiry. So first, let me say something about what we learned in the past year about the specific question. And before I do that, I should share a bit about what nuts is. And I have a short video. that I'll switch to, otherwise we'll get ads. We don't want that. And now just testing to see if everyone online also hears this and in the room. Healthcare data. Is there sound online? Yeah, okay, cool. There we go. Is spread across the IT systems of GPs, specialists, nurses, and other healthcare workers. You would expect this data to be shared between the different systems in a safe manner. And the patients would know who viewed their data. But currently that is not yet the case. That is why we suppliers of healthcare software have joined forces in the NUTS initiative to develop an open source protocol that regulates access to healthcare data. The protocol is like a smart key store that is linked to the healthcare professional software, and it works like this. A physician refers a patient to a specialist at the hospital and provides access to the blood test results in the patient's file. Her key store creates a unique key that clarifies which specialist is allowed to view the file, what may be viewed, and where the file can be found. The key is then stored in the specialist's key store. Only when the key and the identity of the specialist have been checked can he access the patient's data. The patient can view when the key was used and by whom. If the patient or the physician withdraws the authorization for the key to be used, that key can no longer be used to view any data. Safety guaranteed. This is just one of the many ways in which NUTS promotes collaboration between healthcare workers, because every system secured via NUTS allows healthcare data to be shared in an easier and safer manner. NUTS, secure data sharing. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in, in the Netherlands, the acronym alludes to uh, a commons, services for the commons. So our NUTS services would be the electricity, uh, water, uh, and other common services shared by the community. But it also means that we're a bit crazy to go uh, <laughs> and have this challenge. And we, and we abuse this metaphor in many, many ways. So um, <laughs> um, let me get back to the presentation. Yeah, so why is something like NUTS uh, important or why would we do that? Well, in the Netherlands, the healthcare, the healthcare system takes about a seventh of our GDP and is projected to grow and grow and grow in, in relative size in a way that's unsustainable. So we are challenged to really transform that system in a major fashion. And there's many think tanks and policy organizations involved in thinking about how to do that. And uh, they publish policies and there's three things that emerge as, as, as ways to go about it. One is to shift the focus from illness and caring for illness to prevention and health promotion and really make that the starting point of the whole system. Uh, the other is to foster collaboration, uh, coordination and the, between all the health care providers, the caregivers, and with active participation of the patient in flexible networks. And the third is to keep innovating the profession itself and increase the pleasure of working in healthcare because people are leaving that profession in the Netherlands in droves. So 
um, and, and to create an underlying system that supports all this based on open standards. So these are the four emergent points from the policies that the government is trying to adopt in the system. And when we, when we shift from the policies to the content of, of how do we think about health and care, there's two frameworks that I want to highlight that are being used in the Netherlands. One is called positive health. This is actually a redefinition of the, uh, uh, of the healthcare, of the meaning of healthcare from a state of being to a process of relating to, to life circumstances. So we are leaving the illusion that we can fix everybody um, and, and try, to, try to support that interaction with your life circumstances and also expand the idea of health from the mental and physical to also the social, the, the meaning making, the meaningfulness, the quality of life and daily functioning. So that's more, um, more and more a framework that's used in the, in the relationship between caregivers and patients. So we talk about these, uh, these dimensions and on the, on the national level, we are adopting the health in all policies um, uh, uh, perspective from the World Health, World Health Organization. And this means that health is not only the, um, uh, the responsibility of the Ministry of Health, but also uh, because health is also influenced by transport, housing, work, um, nutrition, you name it. Uh, there's also increased col collaboration between all the government functions in the Netherlands to think about how to make this transition. And when we as systems designers then think about how do we support such a transformation, we get to a diagram on the right where the personal, the social and professional realms surrounding healthcare should be able to integrate, relate with each other while doing justice to the specific jargons and languages and histories of those perspectives. So that's a design idea for <clears throat> how we approach the digital support of this system. Also underlying this is a metaphorical transformation. So to support this emergent, this desired future, we need distributed networks to be our frame. Whereas the language that currently is used in the system is one of chains. So, and the, the chain metaphor goes back to the industrial revolution and the emergence of uh, conveyor belts. And then has been adopted, of course, in management um, literature uh, through Porter's work on the value chain. And that's still very much a non-conscious non dominant language that we use that, that doesn't necessarily afford a transition to uh, not only thinking in networks, but being in networks. So having said that, uh, NUTS is trying with uh, our open source protocol to enable this peer-to-peer -peer networking in a safe and privacy-aware manner. Um, and, and setting up these safe connections using these keys uh, and then affording healthcare providers and their IT suppliers to create applications on top of that. And uh, in the first four years, we've been in existence for four years. Several of those use cases, as we call them, have been uh, developed and are now uh, going in production. For example, a more integrated um, uh, birth care use case where uh, the patient uh, uh, and their family uh, allow the network of caregivers uh, involved access to their data, but also the transfer between the elderly care, the hospital and the home care, for example, have been defined and are now using our NUTS network to foster collaboration. Um, shifting from the context to the research that I did as an ISI fellow um, with the help of some of the IT suppliers involved, we created a plan for the next stage of the involvement of our organization. So after the pioneering phase, we're now getting into a phase where we are taken seriously and we must ask ourselves, how do we ourselves grow healthily into this next stage? So we, we defined some outcomes that we would like to achieve in the coming years. And uh, I applied for a fellowship, which I happily got rewarded, awarded and am now sharing some of the findings. So we approached this in the first year by uh, understanding uh, the question that we are asking by doing a literature review and also interviewing the participants in the NUTS network, the IT companies, you see some of their labels at the right, and also looking into some case studies of other open source organizations, either in healthcare or in finance that have organized themselves for a longer period and learn from their practices. 
so one thing that we're learning, for example, is to distinguish between different layers of our organization. One is the ecosystem that we are a part of and that we should have a healthy fit with and be adaptive in. Uh, that's to the outer fringe of, of what we are seeing. Now we've next defined a community level. These are all the people and organizations actively involved with NUTS in some capacity, thinking along, trying to participate, understanding how they can use it. Then there's the actual participants. These are the organizations that are connecting their systems using NUTS as a network. So they are actually co-directing and co-creating a network. And then three organizational circles that support the participants and the community and that fit the ecosystem. Uh, one is a foundation, a nonprofit foundation of which I'm a board director. Uh, the others are technical team who actually make the open source protocols and the open source software that, that uh, participants can use. And the other is a supporting team that I'm actively leading to support the governance, the collaboration around this. So this is some of the things we did in the first year and uh, there's references to the end of the presentation that you can um, check out to explore further. But what I really wanted to share also is what are we learning in the first year about this larger question, this broader question, of how do we make healthy systems. And um, some of the sources that we are using to understand this question uh, uh, I'm sharing here, for example, uh, uh, value networks as a form of organizing and relating uh, the intangible and the tangible, but also um, emergent research uh, like Nora Bateson's recent publication how do we become aware of the of the non-conscious and invisible and hidden processes that actually foster the ability for a system to make a paradigm change uh, that we don't necessarily notice? So how do we become aware of these, what she called readying processes? Um, whereas Verna Ali, her value network analysis is rooted in living systems theory. So we wanted to better understand that too. So we looked into Friedrich Kapka's work, for example. And also uh, in fitting in, in an ecosystem where there's a lot of conventional players and vested interests, we also have to deal with power. So how do we understand power in networks in collaboration? So these are just four, four of the sources that we use to understand the context for this larger question. But in doing justice to the complexity that we find there, we are not necessarily taking a, a an approach where we want to write up what we're finding there directly, but we are trying to use art as a catalyst to understand the complexity that we are feeling and seeing there. And one of the one of the things that I came into my fielding program with is this uh, quote from a poem by John Keats. It also resonates with my own values and ideals. Um, and I, I think that in general, as scholars, we can learn a lot by using art and combining that to understand um, uh, what we are learning. So what I did uh, together with um, our research assistant, who also happens to be our daughter, okay. is uh, create four images that each offer a perspective on this whole that we are learning while integrating some of the ideas from our research. So let me share those with you. The first painting is that um, of a string of onions and um, uh, a view of one of those onions. And uh, the idea here is the, um, actually that was one of the metaphors used by some of the research, of, of the, the articles uh, um, in, in the open source community, health of open source communities. Um, but if you think about that and try to visualize it in art, you see these layers and levels. Um, some of the literature points to the core developers in the community, for example, but where is the core of an onion when you start peeling it? What are you left with? Is there a core to an onion? So um, that image helped us understand some of the complexity of the interaction, influence, the relating and communicating in different layers uh, of a living network. Then, The next painting was influenced by the idea of Ferna Elise value networking, where she, where, where she sometimes says intangibles go to market. So in the healthcare system, a lot of intangible value, if you take it from an intellectual capital perspective, is 
um, generated and exchanged and creates um, the tangible outcomes or fosters the, the tangible outcomes. So how do we how do we think about balancing such values in a system that in the Netherlands, very much like the US, is a public private system with private health insurers uh, and where we have to make agreements on how to reward outcomes in this transformation. Um, so how do we strike a balance between these very different values? How do we use the differences here to distribute wealth? How can we use what we share to make meaning of all of this? What is the value of conversation? What is the value of love in a healthcare system? Questions like these that emerge if we try to make sense of this at a higher level of abstraction. Then the third image alludes to the idea of processes in living systems um, that are constrained in certain ways because we perceive them as flowing from the past to the future or from one part of the system to another, some fast, some slower, um, but also playing with the idea of um, the contrast, if you wish, between pipes and substance that flows through pipes. Uh, so with a wink to Heraclitus, never flowing through the same pipe twice. Um, attaching meaning to what is flowing through these pipes by, by labeling and uh, changing meaning because we uh, gain more experience and put labels over labels later and offering some illusion of tangibility, um, whereas we don't know what is flowing through these pipes as we look at them. And then finally, the idea of patterns emerging from the concrete and uh, relating with the abstract and appreciating that we can generate by interacting from our experience with what we are finding uh, to identify patterns that connect these different aspects of the system. Um, maybe moving from what we see as a coincidence to some synchronicity yeah, or what we perceive as fragmented which is a, use, a term very often used for the Dutch healthcare system at, this, at present, to maybe seeing fractals, things that can be repeated and would then create wholeness slowly but certainly in the system. So having shared that and not wanting to say very much more about this because uh, these paintings also should afford uh, us and, and, and each, every one of us to make meaning ourselves, uh, I want to finish by sharing what we see as uh, our tasks for the coming year. So on the concrete level of the NUTS ecosystem, uh, we've created uh, a plan for uh, uh, evolving the governance, the financing and the organization of, of NUTS uh, in that next stage. And it's been accepted by most participants. And we will be implementing some of the proposals in that plan in the coming year. And we, I think, are also at a stage on that level to define some research approach and how we want to gather data uh, to help share our story as we go to that transformation. So we may have to get an IRB approval for, for that in the next year. <clears throat> and on the abstract level, we want to publish um, uh, something on uh, what we are calling collaborative support networks using some of the insights emergence from our literature review and the art I just shared. And we're working with the World Futures Journal to see if we can make a, a special edition for that with some others involved in different systems also pursuing similar questions. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. And thank you very much. Mm. I have a question. Um, I wanted to know in the model you were showing that that any doctor could um, revoke the key to, for the healthcare um, access to the healthcare information. How is it decided which doctor has which permissions? Because um, it could be a rogue doctor, or it could be someone who 
just has an ego or something who wants to take the key power or something. I, I was kind of um, confused. I'm sure that there's a lot more depth to this. Um, how do you, how does, who gets, who gives the overall permission? Is it the patient? Um, and what if the patient is uh, not knowledgeable enough and is just upset with that particular doctor who actually knows what they need and they're saying uh, anything from this particular doctor I'm blocking and that doctor cannot access or give input, but other doctors need to hear that information. And what if it's a nurse practitioner? It, is there a hierarchy? Those are some of the questions I had. Yeah, great questions. And I understand that they are provoked by what, what we shared. So the, the, const, the system is constrained in several ways. One is uh, 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 legislation. So we have the GDPR in Europe, which uh, which to a large extent frames the legal framework in which we are um, working with the permissions for sharing data. And there are specific um, healthcare laws also that say what practitioners and patients, what their rights are in terms of sharing data or obligations in terms of sharing data. So uh, a doctor who is obligated to share data with a patient cannot themselves restrain that access of the patient to the data, for example. Um, and uh, 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 the NUTS network uses the application, the specific application context to understand permissions for data sharing. So for example, in transferring from uh, an elderly home to a hospital, there is implied consent because you, you are, as a patient, you're saying, yes, I need to go to the hospital. Then the care home can share the patient's file with the specialist in the hospital that they are going to and vice versa. So that's implied consent. But for some cases where information is um, made available before something happens, for example, it requires explicit patient consent. And then that should be recorded somewhere and accessible to the NUTS node to navigate whether they can share data or not. So it, it varies, uh, but it's constrained by law. Okay. Uh, yeah, will this become um, on, on a platform? where all of these uh, circles and are talking to each other and able to see who can communicate and who, who can't? Will it be a platform of some kind? Well, it's, it's, um, that's a great question. It's, it's not a platform in the sense that everybody should go there. Mm -hmm. It is a distributed network yeah. based on peer-to-peer -peer principles where everybody runs their part of the network. Uh -huh. But the information that the network needs to be aware of the network is shared in the network. In the network. Platform, in yes. Or whatever. The, the, net, the, no, the notice can share that data. Yeah. yeah. To be, uh, especially for, uh, you, you need to be able to be discovered. Yeah. So how, yeah. how would they be able to see who's sharing what? Is that in that box? There's, an, uh, there's like a, a register uh -huh. of the, 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 the nodes available in the network and every node can see which caregivers are available in the network. Yes. Hi, Sergey. Thanks for a great presentation. Really fascinating about really focusing on healthy systems. It's so important. Um, I was wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit more about what you intend to do with the paintings. I thought they're beautiful and there's so much information in there. And I wasn't quite clear about how you're going to use those. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure yet uh, in terms of how I'm going to use them because they're fresh of the, the, the paint is just, just dry. But I have experience with making paintings together with our daughter um, from my dissertation onward. And usually in retrospect, they help us sort of navigate the complexity of what we were dealing with in a way that helped us generate new metaphors that could then act as an interface to also create a new model, for example, a conceptual model. But but at present, we just want to uh, live with the uncertainty of not knowing yet. <laughs> uh, and we are publishing them open source. So um, uh, I am on ResearchGate. So if you go there, I'll share the presentation there. And I'm sure, I'm, I hope the ISI would also do uh, distribute the presentations afterwards. Yeah. Uh, thanks, so, thanks so much for uh your project uh, the applied complexity uh to uh, uh to help uh, understand and resolve uh complex problems and issues is it's part of my own 
uh, research. My my dissertation focused on these concepts around shipyards, <laughs> the complexity of it. Uh, for your research, uh, a suggestion, uh, my health care in the US is through the Veterans uh, Affairs, Veterans Administration Healthcare, and they have developed uh, an evolving and very complex and capable uh, uh, medical record system that's integrated. There's about uh, 10 million veterans in that system and what 1400 uh, uh, organizations around the country <clears throat> that serve veterans. At any rate, a lot of these uh, protocols, sharing information, permissions, uh, authorization, verification checks, all that are uh, built in and graphic display systems and stuff. So I, I would just suggest that in your project, at least explore the VA system, uh, you could use that maybe as uh, a, a comparison in some of your data analysis. Thanks, Larry. Great suggestion. Yeah. One of the things I'm considering is comparative case studies. So that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, so the question is, am I familiar with EPIC as one of the EHR systems? Uh, and the other is, is there a chance for also bringing that shift in perspective from a cure to health prevent health promotion and prevention here uh, and, and, and using some of the uh, standards to also uh, then support that? Uh, yes, I am familiar with EPIC. It's also used in the Netherlands in several hospitals. And we have our own Dutch version of it. And they are very much alike in terms of how they present themselves as uh, vested monopolists in the system. So uh, they, are, they are not the first ones to adopt this approach, uh, uh, but they are looking at it. And we are in contact with an American organization called FAST, which is an acronym for FIRE at scale. And FIRE is one of the data standards that's being used in the exchange of the actual data. Uh, and they are uh, tasked by the U.S. government to to sort of scale up the use of that standard. And we, we're talking with each other as organizations to see how this, because it's open source, anyone can use it. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the circumstances are right to use it. So we're navigating those circumstances in which uh, the U.S. could also use our software. Yes. I'll ask the question. Uh, you made several references. Oh, yeah. And uh, I've always been interested in that term since we work on it itself. And everybody loves the idea. But as you know, it takes time, uh, it takes money, often. Uh, it takes uh, unlearning ways of doing things and relearning the way other people do. I mean, it's a, it's a complicated thing to do. Are you addressing them in your work? Or is that sort of ingrained in your perspective? What would you say about the challenges that I mean? Yeah. Yeah, Charles asks how do we challenge the, the, the difficulty of collaboration, the, the aspects that are difficult in collaboration in our project? Um, we do. One of the concepts we use is so the, the more structural concept is collaborative support networks. But the inside of that, if you will, the inside perspective of that is uh, community-based development uh, as a concept for for the for the for the groove to borrow the to invoke the, the metaphor of jazz improvisation. So how do we get a groove in the collaboration? It's much more difficult to do in a system like this than with a jazz band who, who does that naturally. Huh. 
however in in terms of um whom we partner with and whom we look for we don't only look at the structural aspects of the collaboration but also do we do we resonate in terms of um uh, the leadership uh ethos if you will for for working together so we have in our manifesto for example we have a manifesto in which we express some ideals and values that are very hard to practice if you're not collaborative and whenever we are in doubt and we're in doubt often because we have to fit into this ecosystem where we get to deal with all these parties like the the not only the it suppliers but also our government or our health insurers who come from a very different or are, are at least captured in a very different um culture so sometimes we get off tech and then we think oh wait a minute we try to find the one again and get our groove back and and as we try to live into that and exemplify that we attract partners who understand this at a deeper level without having to give words to it so i'm, I'm hopeful for that but it's very difficult yeah yeah let me just follow up uh, the one project that i was involved in years ago was about collaboration around child and so what happens is that social worker Joe Blow gets called from his supervisor and says, I think you have to be on a collaboration task force. So the problem is that they, they don't have any extra money. It's often boils down to money. Okay. Okay, well, we're going to buy it for you. No, how do you, is that a barrier? It is in the in the next stage. So Charles is asking, is there, uh, in bringing together all these parties, they don't budget for collaboration, right? So, so, but there are tasks to do so by their boss. Oh, you're going to collaborate here. You're going to collaborate there. Okay, good job. Good luck, especially yeah. if you're a caregiver, right? So, right. so the the change that that at least in our startup, um, in a start in our startup phase, one of the major uh, uh, suppliers in the elderly care software industry freed up four people's time full time to start this off setting an example so now after four years we are there that the other say 15 uh, 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 logos you saw there are also saying okay now that this is now that we see this is going to work yeah, following the adoption curve we are also going to free up the time of our people to um uh so there's a small a small start and let's see how we can bring that further in this instance <laughs> thank you charles any other questions from here i just had one more yeah um thank you for clarifying uh, that one piece because i was just thinking about it and this is a it's very heartening to see your work uh i i followed so closely um obamacare when it was just coming out the affordable health care and one of the things that I thought was the best part of it, of course, it was completely slashed, was the the commute, the localization of the healthcare provider systems and networks around the country. And that piece, um, you know, you mentioned. But then when you said beauty, that was really great because it's a value that we don't have in healthcare right now. And it's, I mean. Uh, it's extraordinary, and I really feel like that is a essential thing to, you know, you brought forth the the photograph, the the paintings, which are amazing, but also, um, it's a concept that is not as much in our system the, of healthcare. Though the workers, that's what they are. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the bringing in beauty as a value because that does justice to the workers in this system. Mm -hmm. And yeah, okay. what if we were able to connect that back with all the structural things <laughs> that are that are captured in, right? Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yay. What does that mean?
Okay, thank you everyone online for joining us. Um, and um, we will be we will be making the PowerPoints available to you. You will hear from us. Um, you may know that Hillary Lynn has been out of the office a little bit, and so um, we'll we'll coordinate when she's back in, uh, so you can have everybody's PowerPoint. Uh, to remind you again, on February 7th, we had so many people interested in presenting, I didn't have enough room. So we scheduled another session, all virtual, for February 17th. And I've told you about that, and I'll remind you about that. It'll be 9.30 Pacific on the 17th for more uh, really great presenters. Um, and so uh, with that, let us give thanks to our presenters uh, online and in the room. And what a fascinating Goodbye to all of you out there.